this evening. Uh, Pastor Yanni is originally from South Africa. He's living now in Thailand with his family. And uh, it's a great privilege and honor to have them all with us this evening. On your way, we are so privileged to have a father in the Lord in the house with us this evening. Um, I met Yanni, it's been, I think, 11 years ago now, Yanni, uh, when we were just finishing this church building. And I want to tell you that this man has made so many deposits in my life personally, and he's made so many deposits in our congregation. Harvest time has become what it's become in no small part because of the ministry of this apostle that the Lord sent to us at a time when we needed it. And I honor him as my father in the Lord this evening. I want you to just get on your feet tonight and would you give your best welcome for our precious friend, Pastor Yun now. Now let's just look around and see all of our friends. You look good tonight. And you should say, Amen. What do they teach you in this church? <laughs> what a joy to have my precious wife, Sarah, and daughter with me, Nora. Um, we've been traveling for six weeks together. Can you imagine being in a car and in little hotel rooms and uh, just no space? Sarah cooks for us every day in a little stove thing, and, and we have had a ball. Then you know you really love each other. You, you know what I mean? It's really great. Nora is not so keen on going home. She said, I like America, Dad. <laughs> I think the reason she likes America is because we started in Disney World. God help us. <sighs> 19th of uh, March, we flew into JFK, and then 20th, we started on our journey down to Orlando, Florida, and we took, took three days driving down to Orlando, got to Orlando, and uh, three days in Disney World. Somebody should have warned me. It was spring break, the beginning of spring break. Guys arrived in the thousands. I mean, lines were two hours one hour, 90 minutes, it was ridiculous. And I stood in the lines with Sarah. I don't know what we were doing to end up in, in weird type of experiences like rock and roller coaster. Anybody know, know what I'm talking about? Man, you stand for one hour, you get closer and closer to this thing, and suddenly you see it. It's a little, little sort of trolley thing that arrives. And what got me is as I was standing looking at it, it just disappeared. I mean, this thing just went like a puff of smoke left behind. 2.7 seconds to 60 miles an hour. It's like, I'd, at that moment, I just thought, do you know what? I used to have false teeth that were on a plate. I could imagine them hitting the back of my throat when that thing <laughs> took off. It was the most horrific experience. Can you imagine my body hurtling around little corners through whatever the city was they were trying to depict? I've got no idea. It's, it's to some rock and roll group, and they're playing this outrageous music while you're flying through the air. It's unbelievable. And at the end, we, we, the, the, the cherry on the top was a two-hour uh, stop, wait, stand. Um, for what was called Mount Everest. Mount Everest is a torturous sort of event where what they do is they bring you to the end and you think, okay, it's all going to stop now. But what they do is they flick you into reverse to experience it all backwards. So you know what I mean? Have you, it's one thing going down. It's another thing. I don't know how, how the feeling goes, but it's just, it was terrible. And so they've got photos of us. They gave us two photos. And, and uh, Sarah is holding something like... And Nora is going... And I, the excitable person I am, is looking... <laughs> like, what the hang have I got myself into? So it's been wonderful. We've had a wonderful time. And... Uh, it's so funny to think that I hated America. 
Before I came here 11 years ago, all my friends know this story. Um, I hated America. I, I, made, I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere, but not America. I don't, want to, I don't want to hang around with Americans. And I have to say tonight that uh, you, you as a group of people, and in a special way, Harvest Time, has um, been a, a place of refuge and strength and friendship in those early years for me and has become that for us as a family and we're very grateful that Americans have been gracious enough to let me stay even though I had an attitude that stinks. <laughs> so we've had a wonderful time, 11 years now um, of ministry here and it's, it's been wonderful. It really has. We, we look over the places that God's allowed us to go and uh, we're moved. We're moved with the fact that God is doing something through our family. We, um, in December, just before Christmas, we got news of the fact that uh, um, a, an area north of Chiang Mai, up in the mountains, in the village areas, people were dying of cold. Thailand is not known for being cold. So it was an extremely cold winter, just like you had, I believe. And um, the people were suffering. And in a moment's notice, um, Sarah got a, a, an opportunity from God to do something. And she uh, rallied some support and uh, got some people together. And before I knew it, she was dragging me up into the mountains of Chiang Mai, Chiang, Chiang Rai, and we were going to go and minister to these people. She uh, gathered so many s supplies for them. And uh, we got up there for Christmas, not to have a Christmas that we got gifts, but a Christmas where we gave gifts. And it was, it was an outstanding experience. Um, this is the second one Sarah's done, out to, into a, a situation where the relief was needed. And uh, while we were there, so many opportunities came our way. It's funny, you go and, you're going to go and bless people and you end up getting blessed. You, you, you know how it works. And uh, so we were, we were tremendously blessed in the time and especially the one day I, I got the opportunity to speak at a church um, and, and the lady interpreting was, uh, was, was outstanding in her English and afterwards asked very simply if she could she could speak to me, spoke to me, said, would you consider coming to teach the, the leadership, the senior leadership of uh, the churches around Thailand and Southeast Asia? Um, and she, she was a principal of the Baptist Theological College. And so she said, I do the inviting and uh, I would really ha love to have your ministry then. And what a privilege. I mean, that's, that's a door open. I'm seeing I'm a charismaniac to, to go into a Baptist type environment. You can understand. You, you know, it's, 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 it's tremendous privilege. And so um, I was just thinking about that and pondering on it. And I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere, by the way. I'm not just waffling. Um, as I was pondering on that, the Lord said to me, this year is going to be a, a year unique in, in its uh, manifestation. It's going to be a year where people get an unique opportunities that they've been dreaming for, they've been waiting for. They've, they've longed to, to break into areas. They've longed to be launched into certain things. And this year, the Lord is going to move through unusual circumstances that you experience that might not even look like they are uh, nice. They might look uh, objective, you know, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sort of difficult. And so you find yourself in these situations which will lead you into connecting with people, which will lead you into doors, opportunities that you've never had before. And so I realized straight away that God really wants to, to launch people. I've, I've spoken of this word right throughout the six weeks we've been here. And people have come to me one after the other saying, literally this week, something has happened which has opened a door for me which I've never had opened before. And so I just want to encourage you. You need to be people that are ready for what God is going to do with you. I really feel that those who are hungry and, and really set on being used by God are going to find God really launching them at this time. 
And so I encourage you, uh, don't, don't look at what comes at you as something of a pain or a difficulty or a problem. Look into it and say, Lord, is this my opportunity? Because it's often in the worst scenarios, the worst uh, situations, that God launches us into our best opportunities and ministries. And so uh, we pray for you that that will be your experience this year. So I just want to leave that word with you. But would you turn with me in your Bibles if you've got it? I want to talk tonight about living in, a, in the spirit realm and being a person that, that knows how to, to walk in the spirit, how to overcome this realm of the flesh, to, to find ourselves intimate with God at a level we've never experienced before. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 1. Go to verse 9. The heading is vision of the Son of Man. But John says, I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a voice, a loud voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Probably two years ago, I was reading that portion of Scripture, and it jumped out at me, that little phrase, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, jumped out at me so strongly. And I, I realized that we as Christians don't often get to experience what he was talking about. What does it mean to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day? What does it mean to be in the Spirit? Clearly, this was not just, uh, I'm having a time with the Lord. Clearly, this wasn't just a devotional setting. This was a, a moment where this man, this apostle of Jesus Christ, was caught up into a world which is separate from ours, an experience which is not natural, but supernatural. A place from which a number of things happen. I want you to see that it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And the first thing he says is, I heard. There's a strange thing that happens when you get into the Spirit. You start to access visions and sounds and experiences. You start to, to uh, 
experience heaven manifesting itself in your very midst. I'll never forget I was in Canton, Ohio a while ago and we, we were having a meeting where folk just came to be ministered to by the Lord just a time of, of manifestation where the power of God was manifesting himself and um, while we were ministering, the power of God fell so strongly that while I was preaching, people started to sag in their chairs and, and it became chaos. And so... I, I just continued to, to, to just allow the Holy Ghost to manifest and to move while he touched people. And, and things started to happen. S smelled fragrances from heaven started to manifest in the room. People started to look around bewildered. They were going into a place which they didn't understand. They were experiencing things they had never experienced before. Not only that, um, a, a woman very close to Sarah and myself, I think Glenn has already met them, Jack and Jan and Brozick. Uh, J Jan was in the room and, and uh, she was next to another ministry woman called Martha and, and she turned to Martha and she just kept saying, look at his eyes, look at his eyes. And I said to her afterwards, Jan, what were you doing? She said, Yanni, your, the, the, your eyes were, were shining out. The, there was light coming out of your eyes. She said, I thought I was seeing things. She said, but Martha just turned to me and she said, there's light coming out of his eyes. When, when we enter the realm of the Spirit, ladies and gentlemen, th there is released upon us a, an experience of heaven which will forever change who you are. I, I love the power of God. I love it when God shows up and people are touched and, and all that. That's wonderful. But I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not talking about just a touch. I'm talking about a touch that forever changes you. I'm talking about not, not just coming for an experience, but learning to live in a realm where you are regularly in the presence of God. Where you know how to leave this world, should we say uh, we've just watched the movie, um, what, what is that thing about heaven? <laughs> heaven is for real. We went and sat as a family. What a brilliant movie. I enjoyed every bit of it. Not, not because there was anything that I'd never heard, but it was something of, of just, isn't this so wonderful that there's a confirmation again of, of the fact that God is alive and, and speaking to people. This breaking into the realm of spirit. I don't want to do it on a deathbed. I want to do it if it's possible for John. It's possible for me. I want to, I want to live beyond this thing of, of having to, to, to really live daily in all this world and all that goes on in it. The televisions and the... And the you know, the, 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 the rubbish on the roads and the news. And I would love to be, a, be in a place regularly, not once in a while, but regularly, where we can just step into the realm of the Spirit. Where we can just, it's the Lord and I. Tonight, as Pastor Glenn said, we, we received the touch of that. We, we had a glimpse tonight. If we kept going, we would have gone further. But it's not a place that we go to uh, as a group. This, what is beautiful about this story is he didn't need worship. In fact, he didn't even need a crowd. He was by himself in a state of, of being uh, cast out. He was put on a little island 50 miles away from Ephesus in the Aegean Sea. He was, he was locked away. He was a, a pain. He was a political, social outcast. He wouldn't shut up. The guy was 90 years old. He wouldn't keep quiet. He would only preach. He just wanted to preach the word. He wanted lives changed. I want to tell you what, what we need to be to be people that live in this realm of the Spirit. Number one, we need to be people that are burning up with the love of God for others. We need to be people that are so consumed, not with ourselves and where we are, but we're consumed with others. I want to tell you the ministry is such a dangerous place. Let me tell you about it a little bit. The ministry is a place where you can get so busy doing the stuff that you forget why you, got, why you got into it. 
I've been there. I don't want to ever be there again. I want to be in a place where your heart is on fire for the needs of others. That in a moment's notice, my wife will hear of the need and will not sit and say, who will go? But says, send me, Lord. We'll take her last cents and go into these remote areas, drive a four-wheel drive vehicle herself to just go and deliver what God has got for, for those people. Hug these little kids, love men and women who've got scars all over their bodies, have got disease on them. Just pouring out with love. I, I cry, I can't help it. I get there when she starts, I just weep and weep. Because of, of the fact that it's such a privilege to love and to care for people who have got nothing. Such a privilege. It's great to come to people who can give you back. Don't get me wrong. I, I love being here. I love ministering to people in America. I, I love it so much. But I want to tell you our hearts burn for people who will never hear. For people that can never be trained. For people that never can be equipped. For people that can never be touched by the love of God. I want to tell you, nobody drives up there. Nobody goes up there. It's the Karen people. They, they're the guys with the rings around their neck. You, you know what I'm, the ladies have those rings and they've got giraffe type necks. What a privilege. But it's because John would not keep quiet. No matter what the persecution was. It was a tremendous time of persecution, Pastor Glenn. Was people were getting murdered, killed all the time. And this guy would not keep quiet because something had happened to his heart. I want to tell you, we need a heart that is so on fire for God, that is so in love with what God is in love with. For God so loved the world that he gave. Guys, we want God to give us an experience. Why? Why do you want an experience? If the experience does not translate into ministry, yeah. why, why do we want to get touched after touched after touch upon our, our beings? I mean, to, 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 to be touched by God is such a joy, but, but for what? Set my heart on fire, Lord. Set a fire down in my soul. That I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. What a man. He was a man, secondly, that was not moved by his circumstantial environment. He was not moved that he was stuck on a little island under prison guard. He was not moved that he didn't have a fellowship. You can't, people like this you cannot contain. They are deeply dangerous. Do you understand? You think you lock them up, and the very guys that lock you up get transformed. You can't control them. They have, they have something that is not of this world. They are supernatural. And this man, John, was, was, was so alive in God. That it, you know, if this was some pastor writing, he said it would be, I was in my bed sulking on the Lord's day. Because circumstances are not lining up for me. Things aren't as I want them to be. You know, this is not in place. That's not in place. I can't access this. I can't get on the internet. I can't get TV. Any form of deprivation irritates the hang out of me. That's not what he says. He says, I, John, a prisoner basically, on an island for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, was in the spirit. <laughs> in the spirit. 
on the Lord's day. Man's circumstances can't hold me down. I'm not, I don't get excited for Jesus when everything's going good. So the person who, who's going to live a life that experiences more and more of the spirit manifestation and God pouring himself into us is a person that, number one, is passionate for the things God's passionate about. Number two is a person that is not affected by the circumstances because his love is the presence of God. His love is to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. His love is to be in, in, a, in a, a, an environment where he is experiencing not the natural, but the supernatural. He's living at a higher plane. Ladies and gentlemen, we are supposed to live in a place where the others can't go. I love that Acts, Acts chapter 13 speaks about the fact that the, the, the leaders of the church were ministering unto the Lord. You know what I mean? They weren't asking the Lord. They were ministering unto the Lord. They were pouring out love to God. I mean, it's, it's strange to find that these days that a bunch of leaders will get alone and just want to love God. No meeting, no agenda. Let's just get alone and love God, guys. Let's get on our faces and just enjoy Jesus. What are we doing for lunch? Forget burgers, forget paninis, forget everything. We're going to just enjoy the Lord for lunch. You, you know what I'm saying? Most of the leadership are going to look at you and go, what the hell is going on with you? It's lunchtime, brother. It's time to do the natural stuff. If you don't know how to drop the natural stuff and replace it with the supernatural stuff, you don't qualify for being in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I don't know if you're hearing me. Do you know what I'm saying? That, that we, 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 we deny ourselves. That we say no. I have food to eat that you don't know. There's, there's stuff that fills me. That is way beyond this world. I don't need this world. This is why this man qualified. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Thirdly, I want to say, I, I believe he knew how to enter the presence of God. <laughs> Lord, help! I enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I enter his courts with praise. Be joyful. Joyful, thanksgiving, praise are the three keys to entering the presence of God. I don't care how nice you can sing. You can sing like an angel. I don't care how well you can play musical instruments. You walk in here, you start to praise God, and you're a moaner. I want to tell you, you're not even getting into the presence of God. I've got a secret to tell you. God does not like moaners. Listen to me. He does not like moaners. When you go, Lord, what, whatever your moan is. <laughs> my husband. My wife. <laughs> my kids. My parents. Whatever it is. If you're a moaner, and if you're not sure if you are, ask somebody that knows you. <laughs> Glenn, am I a moaner? Don't answer me. <laughs> you understand? Ask somebody that knows you. I want to tell you something. When we start to live in these earthly type behaviors, 
We limit our access to the presence of God. When we are, we, we are well versed at moaning, at dis, uh, being depressed, discouraged, irritated, or well versed at simply carrying a long face. I want to tell you something. You cannot come into the presence of God with that attitude. It's impossible. When you walk up to the throne of the king of kings, even earthly kings know that if you want to come into my presence, I want to see a smile on your face, boy. Don't walk into my presence with a long face because you're going to lose your head. That's a fact. How much more? The king of kings. The, the God who gives us only good things. And so this old man had learned to live in a place of, 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 of practice as to how to come into the presence of his king. It, it, it was a daily discipline with him. I'm going to say something that's maybe a little hard for you. One day we're going to have to grow up. One day we're going to have to get beyond the fact that I get irritated for nothing. I got out of the wrong side of bed. What the hang does that mean? I got out of the wrong side. It's a blue Monday. What is a blue Monday? In the kingdom there's no such a thing. But in the world, people have coined phrases for worldly behavior, for fleshly experiences. And so we, we, if we choose to live in those, we'll forever be limited in the amount of time we spend in the presence of God. So John was a man that had beaten these things. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. There's a discipline there. There's a discipline. You, you, you know, folk, if, if, you, if you really want to walk in kingdom things, you need to have an order to your Christian life. Not, you know, anything goes. There needs to be an order. The psalmist in, in Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who meditates on the law of the Lord when? Day and night. It's a practice that becomes a lifestyle. And so we've got to come to the place where we've disciplined our life into an order. And that order is whenever I have a moment, I, I, I move my mind on things above. I set my mind on things above. And that mind is, is the imagination side of our mind. The part of the mind, not that, that thinks things through, but the part that sees what's unseen. I don't think you're catching me. What, what happens is, is when you and I start to see the meeting, we're praying for this meeting, right? It's coming up. 7 o'clock, it starts on Sunday night. I'm going to attend. I, I trust you prayed. deathly silence. I trust you prayed. And so having prayed, when you're praying, you're not just petitioning, you are imagining. Oh, okay, I've lost you. That means you see yourself in the meeting. You see God coming with power. You, you declare his promises. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. The manifestation of the Spirit, you see it all. And so you're, you're praying into that which has not yet come. I've already seen this meeting in my spirit. Don't look at me like that. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can, ask, not ask, 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 or imagine. 
You and I can't ask if we can't imagine. So what are we going to imagine? What are we going to imagine? Oh God, I hope you show up tonight. What is on the heart of God when his people come together? He's here to meet us. He's already moving in the midst. He's already showed he wants to manifest himself in the worship. We should right now be preparing ourselves and saying, I am absolutely convinced that God is going to show up on my life tonight. I, can, I, I, I imagine that as I'm ministering to you, God is ministering to me. I imagine that. I'm going to leave here richer than when I came. I'm going to receive fresh manna from God tonight. I already seen people set free, healed, delivered. I've seen it already. I'm listening while I'm praying. God, what do you want to do here? Who is it you want to touch? And so as he speaks, you see it and imagine it. Jesus said, I only do that which I see the Father doing. Where do you see the Father doing it? When you're alone in the Spirit. Because it's in the Spirit that you're going to hear. It's in the Spirit that you're going to see the lampstands and the stars and Him who stands amongst them. It's in the Spirit that you're going to be touched by God. And fall is one dead, shaking, as Daniel says, the knees smote together. Yeah. Presence of God so powerful that when the temple was dedicated, no one could stand. The glory filled the house. These aren't things we, we look for one day. God longs to come to us any time we're in the Spirit. You saw the day, the day of Pentecost. When the Spirit fell, the door was forever opened. Peter says, this is that which the prophet Joel spoke about. He never speaks about tongues per se. He speaks about prophecies dreams, visions. I want to tell you what he's saying. He's saying the whole world of divine communication is open to you from this moment. You're going to see what you've never seen. Tonight you're going to see, you're going to wake up to the fact that while you're in the spirit, you're going to see pictures. You're going to see visions. God is going to show you while you're busy holding up that relationship before the Lord, the Lord's going to reveal to you something about that relationship you never knew. God is going to show you something. God is going to speak to you. God is going to give you an experience. When you're in the Spirit on the Lord's day, three things will happen. You will hear, you will see, and you will experience. All of them are valid and all of them are very powerful. Tonight as we minister to you, we want you to be people that have, have made a choice. You see, the, my last point is... John then was given the responsibility to write to the seven churches. He's shown this deep vision, this, this, this incredible picture. And it continues to unfold throughout the book while he's writing. And, and when I was preparing for this, the Lord said to me, he said, do you know, it's only those who through practice, through regular practice have learned to hear me and correctly interpret what I am saying for others. There's no mixture in that. 
There's no self in that. So I have a word for, for this, this great visiting prophet and I walk up and, and I, I, I'm trying to impress this guy because the word doesn't seem to carry such a lot of power. And so I, I had a little bit of me in there. God can't trust you with more if you're not faithful with what you were given. And so this man had become faithful at hearing God and interpreting it without adding flesh, without any form of, I don't like you, so I'm going to add a little bit of a message while I'm prophesying to you. Nothing of the flesh, pure. So God entrusts this man with the end time revelation. He gives him a picture of what's happened in the world, what is happening in the world, and what is going to happen in the world. He tells them the secrets of his heart. I wonder if you and I are used to being used by God. Whether whenever God speaks to us, we faithfully deliver it, no matter how big. Whenever God wants to use us, we faithfully give. We faithfully pray. We faithfully minister. You see, when, when we get into that sort of position, folk, we, we can be trusted. When you get into the spirit, God is able to give you so much more because he can't go past where you have learned to be faithful. He can't take you further than when you are being entrusted with something. You treat it with the respect and the diligence that it deserves. Do, do you understand me? Not, I feel God telling me to go to this place, but you know what? I don't feel like it this week. I feel God has called me to encourage this couple, but... You know what? I really don't like talking to them. <laughs> what you've just done is put a handbrake upon your future development. Yeah. Wow. You've got to be able to go to anyone. You've got to be in any circumstance and be happy to minister anyway. Think about it. He was given one of the world's greatest revelations in one of the most uncomfortable places. Isn't that strange? Nelson Mandela from our nation who just died a little while ago. Prison kept him. But what prison did for him was transform him. Because he chose to be a man that opened himself to living better. He was a violent, dangerous man. They didn't put him on Robben Island for nothing. But in jail, he got a revelation about life. And when he stepped out of the 20-something years of incarceration, he stepped onto the world stage and he said, it's time for us to call bygones bygones. It's time to start afresh. So few people know the better way. So few people allow life's difficulties to make us better people. Not bitter, but better. So few people learn to adjust who they are. Obnoxious. Cocky. Do you understand cocky? Is cocky a right word? <laughs> I'm scared of America, man. I have said words <laughs> that have got me into a lot of trouble. I'm not going to go there. I'll just... So... You, you know, it, it, is, it is vital for us to be people that take time to know ourselves. 
and to, to do a full check on the vehicle. It's come up for 100,000 kilometers. It's time to check it out. How is it doing? What needs replacing? I tell this story, and, and, and I'm closing. I, I've possibly told it here before, but, but please forgive me. Thanks, sweetie. You know, when, when I was young, my, my mom used to bake cakes. In those days, it was common for women to cook and bake and all the rest. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> anyway, so I used to stand in the kitchen with my mom, and, and my mom was a funny being. She, she would, at 10 o'clock, she would stop everything. She would make a cup of tea. She would take two slices of brown bread, put butter on it, slice of cheese, a lot of onion, close it, cut it, and have a cheese and onion sandwich with a cup of tea at 10 o'clock every day. That was, that's my mom. So <laughs> she would bake and... But she, she would show me how the baking would go. So, so I know you take this bowl and you put flour in and you put butter in, you put milk in and you mix it up, a bit of baking powder and not too much otherwise it burns a little bit, you know. I, I know some things about baking. So she mixes it up and then she pours it into a well-greased pan. Got to be well-greased with like a, a oil paper on it. And uh, when she's... When she's finished preparing it, she slips it into the oven at whatever degrees, let's say 370, and she, she closes the door. And by the way, we have different degrees to you, so just remember, when we say 32, you think cold. When I say 32, I, believe, I feel hot. Okay, it's different. So she slips it in the oven and just waits a little while. After a while, she'll take it out and she'll take a knitting needle and she'll stick the knitting needle in the cake. Weird behavior. What are you doing that for? But she'd stick it in the cake, pull it out the cake and look at the knitting needle. And if there was still some cake on the knitting needle, back in the oven, God comes to us after cooking us for a little while. Puts a knitting needle in and pulls out and says, still a bit of flesh on that. Back in the oven. You need to cook a little bit more. How much flesh would come out if we stuck a knitting needle in you. I want to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. I want to be in the Spirit tomorrow. I want to be in the Spirit in my car. I want to be in the Spirit in my bedroom. I want to be in the Spirit when I land in Thailand on Wednesday. I want to be in the Spirit when I land in Dubai on the way there. I want to enjoy this great privilege of having the one who gave everything for me. The one who's looked after me and my wife and my daughter in the most generous, loving ways you can imagine. The one who never says no to me. The one who always wants my best. The one who gets ignored more than adored. But still is there every moment of the day. That one, his name is Jesus. I want to learn how to love him more. I want to learn how to be in the Spirit so that I can hear things from heaven. I can see tomorrow. 
and I can be touched by the power of the great King. That unbelievable power that raises the dead, cleanses leprosy, causes the blind to see again. The other day I was in James Lilly's church and was ministering on something. And a man walked in with crutches. And at the end of the service, one of the staff came to him and said, I found a pair of crutches at the back of the church. The man came in on crutches and was so touched by God, he didn't even remember that he came in on crutches. And he walked out totally healed instantly by just preaching the Word of God. <laughs> Guys, God wants to touch us tonight. You know how much He loves you. You know how much He loves you. Your dad wants to pour blessing on you tonight. So let's just stand for a moment, can we? Let's just tell him we want to be people who are in the Spirit every day. Would you, would you repent from where you were? Say, Lord, I, I haven't taken this seriously. I don't know that you can trust me with writing anything or telling anything. But I want to come back. I want to come back to the place where you can use me, Lord. Come on, let's just let heaven rain on us right now. Forget the people next to you. We're not here for a show. We're here to be in the Spirit. Receive. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We want to put off our griping and groanings. We want to put off bad attitudes. We want to be in joy and thankfulness. We just want to praise you, boast about you tonight. You're our mighty God, El Gibor. We love you, Lord. Now, Lord, come, I pray. Fill this place with the glory, O oh God. In Jesus' name. Oh, Tamashi desikata. Shamo to Hisere desita. Jesus. This is just getting yourself ready, that's all. Would you do that? Let's get yourself ready. Determine that you're going to be tr able to be trusted by God to do what God wants to do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If your home has been a place with less than the peace that it should have, Come on, become people of peace tonight. There's no better place to be found than bowing to Jesus. Bow your heart. We encourage you to come forward tonight and, and just receive a touch from the Lord. And as you feel, just stand where you are. You're welcome. Let God just rain on you our desire is to see God touch you praise you Jesus just want to help you a little bit don't look for a specific experience from God don't, don't do that just yield yourself right now. Put on it. Desperation. Lord, I really want your touch. Not Lord, I hope you touch me. 
desperation and expectation. Would you work with me tonight that when I put my hand on you or to speak to you, that you allow the Holy Ghost to just come. In whatever form he wants to, he comes as a dove, he comes as rain, he comes as fire. But when the Lord touches you, I don't need to stand there ongoingly. He is doing the work. I'm just a catalyst. And so once he starts to work on you, don't rush away until you feel it's done. You're not here for an experience. You're here for the Spirit to touch your life and to leave a change. Okay? So I want you to just be open. If you feel like uh, you, you're falling and you're a little scared, that's okay. You know, open your eyes, steady yourself, and nobody's around you, that's fine. But if we're around you, just let God do what He wants to do. Falling doesn't prove God's touching you. My brother I just prayed for up there, I felt the Lord lifting him up. He wasn't going down, he's lifting him up. And he, he, what will start happening, last thing I want to tell you, is you're going to start to, while I'm praying for you, see things. Hear God pointing you somewhere, telling you something to change, telling you something he wants you to do. You need to listen now. Now, this is the realm of the Spirit. It's going to get stronger and stronger, and more of you are going to start to, to experience God in a, a, a different way. Okay. Thank you for the ministry. Just great worship. Jesus.